It became evident that Alan wasn't orange enough. That, and as I mentioned in prior episodes, his gel coat needed some additional protection. I considered other colours, but didn't like red. Yellow would copy another well-known lifeboat conversion project, and most other colours would camouflage Alan, which isn't the aim. Alan likes to be the centre of attention. We all know someone like that. Anyhow, here's part one of Alan's encounter with a pot of paint. So today's the day when I'm going to do the first of the paint job sections. And I'm actually going to divide the boat up into certain areas. So this zone at the back is going to go from sprinkler to sprinkler. And that basically means that I can do the joins around the back of the sprinkler. So if there's a slight demarcation between the different uh, paint jobs, then you won't really notice it. And it means I can do it in a more, um, uh, in a more controlled fashion than trying to do the whole boat in one day. But luckily we've had a, a few days of, of nice weather here in the UK before it gets cold again. This is still springtime. And it means that, that that sort of stable weather means I can do the paint job without damaging the quite fragile polyurethane two-pack paint, which uh, needs very, very specific conditions in which for me not to muck up the whole thing and have to do it all again. It's going to be a multi-stage process. And of course, there's the old painting truism that is mostly about preparing the surface and less about actually painting. It depends what you actually want though. I've done the listening and watching and reading and want to balance up time taken, money spent, protection added and the quality of the surface finish. Lifeboats are non-cosmetic work boats right out of the factory and never have a flawless mirror finish. There are slight undulations in the hull, most likely as the moulds are designed purely for satisfying lifeboat safety regulations and not the discerning gaze of someone buying a sun seeker on the Costa del somewhere. I've made a pretty big decision and that's that I'm going to roller the entire boat and that's a decision made on balancing up ease, speed, skill level required and also the level of surface that I think is going to be acceptable now because lifeboats are not made to a high cosmetic standard and they are work boats after all uh, there's no point I think trying to go for a perfect mirror finish with both rolling and tipping which is when you use a brush straight after rollering to try and uh, even out what might end up being like an orange peel effect but I'm going to use a high quality roller to try and minimize uh, that effect and see how it goes. I'm aware of some magic paint additives that claim to give perfect self-leveling of the surface while still wet, but they're hard to get hold of in the UK. The preparation around the hatches took the most time. They weren't well sealed before, and I'd noticed a couple of very minor leaks, so I've gone all in. Using a really good marine sealant that's both overpaintable and critically sandable, I went round all the interfaces and gaps. At first I took loads of time with masking tape and silicon shaping tools, getting the sealant perfect, but then saved masses of time just getting it on there. It sands back pretty quickly into a smooth shape once fully cured. The little plastic nodules over the bolt and screw heads needed priming, and then once I was happy with all the details, it was time to prepare the bulk of the hull surface. I'm only doing the top side down to the hull join fender strip, as I'm not ready to anti-foul Alan's underside just yet. I was devastated to learn that to provide a key for the paint by sanding back the surface through any residual wax or contamination, an angle grinder was not the preferred or even recommended power tool of choice. I reluctantly fetched the orbital sander and got down to it. Mostly I just skimmed over to give the paint something to grip onto, but gave other areas where I'd repaired dents with filler a little more attention. I've said I'm not going for a perfect super yacht mirror finish, but let's have some pride in Alan's appearance. As with the sanding of the filler, I've done the major stock removal quickly with a rough and ready 60 grit sandpaper and then gone over with the 200 or 400 grit to neaten up the surface. I've not gone through the gel coat anywhere that I've noticed and so I'm guessing that it was of a substantial thickness when first laid up. A discovery I've only just made and that I only just bothered buying when I was getting the foam rollers and wanted to add enough items to my online basket so as to get the free delivery threshold, is fabric sandpaper. It's a revelation. It rips easily to whatever size you need, flexes well, and can wrap around your finger for doing curved sections, and seems to last forever. Well worth the slight premium in price over normal sheets of sandpaper. Once I desecrated Alan with abrasive paper, he needed a rinse, so to get rid of any residual dust or grot, I washed down all the surfaces to be painted with sugar soap and then buffed with a low lint microfiber cloth. Aside from a few failed tests where I had messed around on one of the hatch doors, this is the first time I've used two-pack paint in anger. I've gone for a high gloss abrasion resistant polyurethane paint in the RAL color 2010 
Apparently, alum was originally RAL 2005. As with all two-part substances, and from my experiences laying up composites with epoxy resins, I need to be very precise with measuring out the paint and the hardener. The horror and dismay of having to strip back a sticky, partly cured coat on the hull wouldn't bear thinking about. Then, the dark art of paint thinner. I've used pure xylene from a hardware store, as it's much cheaper than the identical name brand thinner from the paint company. The percentage I've chosen was informed by my hopeless tests. Too little, and you get a heavily textured, messy surface. Too much, and you end up with a runny mess that doesn't form a proper high gloss. Given the weather here is only 10 or 15 degrees, with occasional direct springtime sun, I've gone with 15% of thinner, so the cold paint isn't too gloopy. I can also do another coat if there's not enough opacity, but it's harder to sand back an overly thick and droopy coat. The experts have drilled it into me. Thin coats, thin coats, don't overdo it. In this episode, we're just going to cover the initial coat, largely because I haven't finished the subsequent coat yet, or all the edges and brush painted details around the fixtures and areas where a roller can't get to. There's quite a lot of finishing touches that take a lot longer than the simple job of rolling, even when I'm trying to do an efficient job and not a showroom finish. I've been learning, hopefully fast-ish, as I've been working. Roll too fast and bubbles form in the surface which you need to then either carefully roll out immediately or wait for the cure and then sand back to repaint. Too slow and the curing process runs away from you and you get ridges between the rolls before you can smooth them into one homogeneous surface. Too much paint or pressure and you get drips or sagging. Too little and it's hard to get a consistent coverage. It's a whole different level of skill compared to painting your walls at home with emulsion, but we're creating a protective shell for Alan here. All manners of trials, misfortunes and temptations will befall Alan on his future expeditions, so it's vital I put the effort in now. Plus, it makes him a bit shinier. Watch out for the second part of this painterly wonder and excellence in the coming weeks. I'm making an expedition electrics test video at the moment, and so there'll be a short wait before the next Alan video. I'm sure you'll forgive me that, and can pass the time by yelling at strangers in the street and telling them to subscribe to my channel, wear Alan's new t-shirts and hats, and to read my books. Yep, I still got the book plug in there after all.